Hey guys, I wanted to do another video comparing mitosis to meiosis. Uh, so here it is. Um, the first thing is this nice little Venn diagram. So on mitosis, I've already talked about, it occurs in pretty much all organisms except viruses, although there is a lot of debate whether a virus even qualifies as an organism because it is just a group of proteins. But unless you're a virus, if you are a living organism, you do mitosis. Mitosis is what creates your body cells, it's what repairs wounds, it what, it's what allows you to grow, etc. Um, and it does consist of one cell division. So ideally, there's going to be no recombination or crossing over of any of the chromosomes involved in mitosis. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we are talking about meiosis, but what recombination or crossing over is, is essentially an exchange of parts of the chromosome with one another. So genes moving around, if you will. Mitosis is going to produce two diploid daughter cells, and those daughter cells are going to be identical to each other and to the parent cell. Now, meiosis, on the other hand, is entirely different. It only is going to occur in animals, plants, and fungi, and its function is to create sex cells specifically. So I'm talking about sperm and eggs. In opposition to mitosis, instead of just one cell division, there are two that go through to produce the sex cells. Um, and there is recombination, there is crossing over of that genetic material that's going to occur during the, one of the prophases. The products of meiosis are again a little bit different. Instead of just producing two identical daughter cells, they're going to produce four haploid daughter cells. And those cells are going to be genetically different from one another and genetically different from the parent. But they do have a couple of things in common. They do follow the same basic steps. They each start with one parent cell and their function is to create new cells. So to remind everyone what the difference is between diploid and haploid, we have diploid over here, meaning 2N. So in humans, that means that we have 23 chromosomes. Most of our cells have pairs of those chromosomes. So we have 46 total chromosomes or two times N meaning we have two sets of each. That's called our, that's the case for our somatic cells, which are our body cells, our nerves, our muscles, our bone, our stomach cells, our skin cells, anything. Haploid, on the other hand, is just N. So our haploid cells, our sperm and eggs, only have 23 chromosomes, or one version of each of those chromosomes. And the only cells in our entire body that apply to that are our gametes, or our sperm and eggs. Now here's the basic diagram for mitosis. We have interphase before the DNA curls up into chromosomes. We have prophase where that nuclear membrane is going to disappear and um, our centrioles are going to start to form. We have metaphase where the chromosomes are going to line up along that midline, that center plate of the cell. Then we have anaphase where the sister chromatids are going to separate, going to opposite ends of the cell. And finally telophase where the nuclear membrane starts to reform and um, the cells themselves are mostly separated. Now after this, there is one extra step called cytokinesis that is separate from mitosis where the actual two cells do separate, but this is the overall process of mitosis here. If we compare that to meiosis, on the other hand, you can see that meiosis is wildly more complicated. We have two main parts of meiosis here, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, and in every part of meiosis, there's the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So here, after our original cell is an interphase, we have prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, telophase 1, and then cytokinesis 1 that's not pictured there. Then after that, we have prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, and finally telophase 2 and cytokinesis 2. So to take a slightly deeper dive and to look a little bit more at that, we have meiosis 1. So like I said, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis 1 are going to occur here. 
So we have the same basic thing happening in prophase one. We have the nuclear membrane disappearing. We have our centrioles forming, the spindle fibers forming. But one extra thing that happens here that didn't happen in mitosis is this thing called crossing over. So if you look really closely here, you can see that there's a little bit of overlap of this blue chromosome and the purple one here. And what's actually happening there is those two chromosomes are exchanging genetic information. So think of it as one section of the blue chromosome gets moved to the purple chromosome and one section of the purple gets moved to the blue. And you can see the same thing happening there with the orange and the red one. Now that's important because that allows for more genetic diversity of the daughter cells later. And you want them to be genetically different because that provides more variance in traits in your organisms later. Metaphase one is gonna be pretty much very similar to in mitosis, except you'll see that these two, so these two here are a homologous pair and those two there are a homologous pair. They are replicated, because you need copies of both, but those homologous pairs are going to line up, or we refer to that as a tetrad, because you can see one, two, three, four are lining up on the middle. And then in anaphase one, our homologous pairs are going to separate, which means that all of this blue one is going to go towards the left. Both of the sister chromatids of the blue go left, both of the sister chromatids of the purple go right, and the same thing with our orange and our red. And that's important because if you recall, um, our homologous pairs, you got one homologous chromosome from your mom and you got one from your dad. So if these are your cells going through mitosis, everything you got from your dad for this chromosome is going left. Everything you got from your mom from this chromosome is going right. But that's not necessarily always true. So like this one could be from dad and this one can be from mom, but maybe this one's from mom and this one's from dad down here. Telophase one is pretty much the exact same as in mitosis. You have the nuclear membrane kind of reforming a little bit there. You have um, the cells themselves separating in cytokinesis one. Now in mitosis two, mitosis two is the most similar to, or meiosis, sorry, this is mislabeled. This is supposed to say meiosis two. Um, but meiosis two is the most similar to mitosis in general because you have the exact same things happening in meiosis two that you have happening in mitosis. You have your prophase, which nuclear membrane disappears. Uh, we have our spindle fibers, we have our centrioles. In metaphase two, your chromosomes are lining up on that metaphase plate. In anaphase two, your sister chromosomes are separating just like you would have in mitosis. And in telophase two and cytokinesis two, the exact same thing is happening as in mitosis. So again, I apologize, this is supposed to say meiosis two up there, but meiosis two is the most similar to mitosis that there is. One thing I do want to draw your attention to is the law of independent assortment. And that basically states that chromosomes are going to sort themselves randomly into the daughter cells. So once again, let's say that this red chromosome you got from mom and this blue one you got from dad, and this is the original cell that has gone through the DNA replication already. Well, in this first stage in meiosis one, now, when that's happening and um, initially those things are going to separate, they're going to separate randomly. So in this case, with this on the left, you see that um, the blue went here and the red went there. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's always going to be a thing because you could just as easily have the blue and red go one direction and red and blue go in the other direction. So whereas here, this um, gamete initially, or not initially, finally has all the blue chromosomes 
and this one has all the red, you could easily have some sort of combination thereof. And that's exactly what happens because we don't only have two chromosomes, we have 23 pairs of them. And so any sort of random assortment and random movement of chromosomes could happen and does throughout meiosis II, giving you wildly different daughter cells, wildly different sperm cells, wildly different egg cells, which is good because that means that any offspring that you have are going to be genetically different from you, which evolutionarily we've talked about why that's a good thing, why that's important. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about sperm and egg cells specifically. There are some differences that you may or may not be aware of um, in terms of how they form and how many of them form at any one time. So <clears throat> in any particular menstrual cycle, one egg cell is going to participate in that. Whereas when you're dealing with sperm, on the other hand, there's about between 250 to 280 million of them present in each ejaculation which seems weird, like why would you only have one egg cell per that many sperm cells? But really what happens during sexual reproduction is the vast majority of them die. And the reason for that is one, because they die on the way to fertilize the egg cell due to overly acidic conditions and a bunch of other factors, but also they're essentially competing for the fertilization of that egg. And the stronger sperm cells are more likely to survive. And therefore, when you have the stronger sperm cell fertilizing that egg cell, you end up with a stronger offspring, usually. That doesn't always happen, but usually. Um, another difference between the two of them is that eggs are very large. They are the largest diameter cell in the human body whereas sperm are ridiculously tiny. So the sperm would be essentially comparable to the size of my mouse in comparison to this egg cell. They're tiny, 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 tiny. They are both haploid. They both have only 23 chromosomes. Um, but there is a difference in mitochondria, which might strike you as weird because if you're thinking, well, the sperm cell is the one that has to travel, it's the motile one, why wouldn't it have more mitochondria and more energy? But it, again, it's very tiny, whereas the egg is where everything's going, and the egg is going to be the thing that's dividing and making a new human, so it requires a lot more mitochondria. And you can see their graphical representations, a little drawing there. Another difference between sperm and egg formation is spermatogenesis versus oogenesis. Spermatogenesis is, I bet you can guess, the formation of sperm cells versus oogenesis being the formation of egg cells. And sperm generation goes exactly how you would assume it would go. You have meiosis one and meiosis two producing four genetically different daughter cells or sperm cells in this case. But oogenesis is a little bit different. Something weird happens during the meiosis process of egg cells. And that is that oogenesis only produces one viable cell by the end of it. And it produces three polar bodies. These polar bodies are not functional in terms of reproduction. They don't really do much. It's because they don't have much of the cytoplasm that the functional egg cell has, and that causes them to kind of degenerate and die and go through apoptosis. But what's interesting is that they can still be utilized. In humans, they're not going to be utilized by our body. They're just going to die. But if um, if scientists are going to use them for something, they've used them in the past to do genetic studies because, again, they do have that genetic information there. Um, they've actually used it in place of doing embryological biopsies because uh, taking a biopsy of embryos can be pretty dangerous, although there are ways to do it. You can do it during uh, using chorionic Bailey sampling, or you can do it um, a few other ways as well but scientists have used it for that purpose. But in animals and some plants, actually, they do serve a purpose. 
in, I believe it's some animals and some plants. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure it's both. Sometimes the polar bodies are actually used in nutrients. So sometimes they'll actually serve a purpose in like that kind of similar to the yolk. They'll provide nutrients for the developing embryo or the developing plant or whatever it is. Um, and so that's pretty interesting. There's an NCBI article that I can send to you if you're interested in reading about that. But hopefully this cleared up some of your questions about the differences between meiosis and mitosis. Email me if you have any questions whatsoever.